Hello, everyone. This is Gruesome Herzog. My very special guest is producer, director, Karen Lamb. Karen, how are you? I'm very well. Happy to be here. Thanks for coming on. Yay. Um, as you know, um, I've seen two of your films. Um, of course, I got the newest one before the other one, but um, <laughs> that's how it works usually. But uh, um, a lot of movies, I mean, a lot of directors do that. You know, these are whatever. I'm babbling. But the first film I do want to talk to you about is, I'll start with the one that you sent me just recently, and it's Stained in 2010. Now, I think Shar Harden saw this, I think, and she was talking to me about it a couple of times, yeah. and I said, you know what, I want to see this. And then we got in a conversation one night on Facebook, and whammo, here it comes in my door. <laughs> now, yeah. now, I, like I said in the review, you have a. Each director has their own style of a thriller slash horror. You know, some of these films you can see um, your background of growing up. You know what I mean? And you mm-hmm. can put it in your films. And I've noticed this with your film. There's a couple of scenes in this film that I know if people ain't paying attention, they won't catch it. But I mentioned to you in a phone about it. Obviously, we can't talk about it in case people who didn't see it. I don't want to ruin the film. But Karen, I'm going to tell you something. You have a, this is a very unique style of film. And if you don't mind, if you want to give the listeners an idea of what Stain's about, that'd be cool. You want me to actually pitch it? Sure. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I guess I've always, I, I've always considered it, um, I mean, it's not exactly autobiographical, but it's a, it's a story about a, a young woman who isn't exactly what she appears to be, and you know, my elevator pitch was always a crazy cat lady who actually might be. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little close to my heart, and, and uh, it's, uh, it, it pretty well is an examination of a, of a, of a young woman who has um, some secrets that she's, you know, that she's uh, just kind of dealing with. Right, and the cats in the film, now, <laughs> I'll say this because I'm not giving nothing away. Um, when listeners, when you do watch the film, um, there's a couple shots in the film where the camera strolls down to the cats. Now, I thought that was very unique. I mean, it's like, <laughs> is there, a, there must be something to, that has to do with what's going on in this film. And uh, I thought it was unique. I, I mean, I keep saying it. I thought it was neat that, I don't know, it's, I'm babbling, but the film was shot so well. I mean, it wasn't overdone. It was on the even keel. It has the, you know, it, it has the uh, the woman that's not quite there. And then you have a friend that's, for a while there, you never saw her face. <laughs> yes. And that that, was, yeah. I'm thinking, what's that all about? And then all of a sudden it shows the face. But a well-made movie, Karen. I, I, I liked it. Thank you. You know, uh, you know I, I've always thought, I, and it's funny because I had a, um, had a meeting with a new director of photography yesterday just to you know get to know people. And, and uh, I, I thought to myself that, one of the jobs that you have as a director and you know for you know what, what first as a writer is that you're obviously coming up with a story by the time you're actually directing i think that what you're trying to do is get out of the way of the film i think that's really important to me that you can choose to do something really stylish you can do things that are very self-conscious and to basically draw attention to you like hey look there's a 360 shot or whatever it is i've always tried to do the exact opposite which is not to say that you know i, I don't want something that looks and feels stylish but that everything that you choose to do however you frame it however you put whatever you put on 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 film is there because you deliberately were trying to to, to help the story, not not so that you know people sometimes notice that. I mean, I'm 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 amazed that you actually did notice a lot of these um, the the techniques. But again, most of the time, I try to stay like kind of out of the way of the of, of the filmmaking and, and the story itself. So right, you know, I, I, again, I really enjoyed it. Um, the ending, um, obviously, we can't speak of, but that was <laughs> a. Uh, you're you're sitting there watching it. You're going, oh my god, wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> Enough said. Um, you sent me a short film that also that I've been seeing going around on Facebook. It's mm-hmm. called Da Parts. Now, here's another film that the ending is not what I expected it to be. Um, you know, it, yeah. 
I see I'm bad one again. Your <laughs> film style, which I'll edit some of this out, by the way, but your film style is so unique. I mean, I, I, it's hard to explain. When you're watching the film, you come from a different angle that a lot of directors that won't do it. Do you know what mm. I'm saying? It, it, that sounds stupid. No, 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 no. That 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 does make sense. I, I mean, I think that. I mean, I, I guess it's hard. I, I I do have a photography background as well. I don't actually. I don't think about my style in in that sort of way. I do think that your films, in a lot of way, reflect who you are. And I think that in some ways, I'm that. People, when they first meet me, think you know I'm a certain something or other because of you know maybe how I dress or how I present myself. But you know that inner monster always comes out at some point or another. So. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I really enjoyed that one too, and that's what got me, you know, to know who Karen Lamb is, you know. And there's a couple other films that are earlier that I think you said that you sent me the cabinet. Yeah, I just I think it should be on on route, and I, I think that you know that's the first thing I ever directed or, or wrote, and um, it went through like it, it actually won uh, a national prize just to actually get done. It was called the the Drama Prize, and it was through the National Screen Institute in Canada. So that was my first. Uh, you know, basically my first start as a as a filmmaker. So, I mean, I've been producing for years before that. So, you know, uh, again, that's that's my background. But this is sort of a chance where, you know, I, I actually got to, um, you know, and and part of that is, that, you know, through cabinet and through stained and through doll parts, it's it's about exploring, you know, how you tell stories. And and I think that there's themes that come up again and again for me, which are really interesting that I always want to explore, which is. Uh, I think you said that in your in your review of Doll Parts, which is that you were never sure who, who the victim was, and I really like the idea of not being quite sure who. Like, and I think that's all the way through all of the the films, which is you don't really know who's good or who's bad, or or if you know who actually is a victim. And that's the kind of films that I really enjoy. Is I mean, obviously in horror, there's always going to be a bad guy right up the front, right off the bat. Mm-hmm. But there's also a style to where, like you said, I'm really into that. That you really don't know who's worse, and that's what that's what what doll parts did for me is the ending is like wow. I mean, who's the bad person here? You know, <laughs> right? But that's that's the entertainment value of your films, and you know, that goes the same way basically for Stained. I mean, they're really, I mean, was a really a good person. Yeah, well, you know, that's the whole. I I think that I've heard a couple of um, reviews on Stained or, or people's reactions to it, and they often say, you know, for and hopefully this doesn't give anything away, but you know, the idea that who they thought was the bad guy, you know, they they, they weren't sure whether it was such a fair ending. But um, you know, the way that I look at it, it's it's that same question, which is, well, who really is to blame out of this? And so, I mean, I I, I think I was watching um, a documentary a few uh, was it last year the uh, Red White and Blue Nightmares one yeah. on, on American Horror, and I thought one of the most interesting things that I, you know, that was brought up, I think it was either John Carpenter who was talking about the idea of the horror without versus the horror within, and you know, some people do the horror without really well, you know, those are the external serial killers, it's the the monsters, you know, I I just, um, it's harder for me, I'm I'm much happier with the, with the you know, the, basically the evil within, which is what if your own brain turns on you or, you know, what if, you know, that, that sort of I- idea that you might actually be a monster yourself, so. All right. Yeah, you know, that's the thing, you know, um, I don't know, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it depends on like there's it's actually I, I was reading somewhere that um, culturally speaking some some cultures really don't get that monster from within they much prefer like you know um, you know that external threat that happens and and those actually travel really well the harder ones to do are unfortunately what I you know what I really like myself which is the puzzle piece you know the idea of of actually um, and maybe that's because you know I enjoy creating little puzzles and and you know it's 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 less um, for me the filmmaking is less emotional I think in some ways than it is creating sort of like a, a giant puzzle like I I, I love you know old Agatha Christie books and that idea of like there's a murder mystery and you have to solve it so that's I, I think that's where I start with in a lot of my scripts too which is uh, a little it's probably much more um, you know structural and 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 almost like designing something rather than it is just kind of writing from some deep heartfelt place 
Right. You know, I just realized something that I watched one of your films that you're an executive producer or a co-executive producer. Oh, yes, The Bone Snatcher. Yes. Yeah, that was my first feature film ever, and uh, I, 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 it was a Canada, UK, South Africa co-production. So, yeah, that was, I learned my ropes on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I haven't yet to review that. I just remembered that I've seen that. That's way before I even did the podcast. But uh, now, mm-hmm. if, I, if I may ask, now, what was your experience like on your first production like that? I mean, it's for every production. When you know you have different roles that you play, especially as a producer, it's like you can you can be the financial person, you can be the you know the on set person. You know, there's a lot of different um, a, little, a lot of different hats. Especially since it wasn't a huge budget, but you know it was three countries, and so there was six producers all together. So you have to find your own position on that. Um, I I, w- I did a lot of the financing. We did all the CGI in Canada, and uh, you know basically my my business partner. Um, Koa Podolsky, who's a producer on it as well, she actually went down with the production. So, and that was shot in Cape Town and Namibia in South Africa. So it was it was interesting because um, essentially, you know, all of our time zones were all different. So, and we had like four currencies, and, and you know, it, it becomes quite a it, it's an exercise in, in paperwork at that point. So. Wow. But it was a it was a fabulous experience and and you know I look back at it and I just remember they they used to have a clock in the UK that was called the Karen clock so that they knew when I was getting up uh-huh. and thank God for those days where you know back then we didn't have Skype I I think and so I literally had to put the my phone on mute while they were you know we'd conference call almost every morning they'd wait until eight o'clock when I was kind of like out and around and I'm glad they didn't have Skype because you know I'd often be in my PJs and I'd have to put the mute on so I'd be crunching my toes quietly you know like. <laughs> Because <laughs> right. they'd be at the end of their day, you know, their five o'clock was my eight o'clock. So it was always, um, you know, just trying to get those those timing things. But then we had a U.S. distributor, so they thought nothing of calling me at all hours just to complain about something that my partners were doing in the U.S. You know, in the U.K. So it was a, it, it's a, it, it's it's actually more of a, a problem in just logistics. I think when you have that many countries and partners. Yeah. Now so. I'm going to move around here now. <clears throat> There's a short film called Headshot, 2006. Yes. <laughs> now, I haven't seen this yet, but do you want to give this as an idea of what what this film's about? Oh, it's the um, that is our the blooper reel for a uh, snuff film. So it's a <laughs> it's a comedy <laughs> snuff film, and uh, we did uh, extraordinarily well with that one. It was a a short film that I produced for my writer director very good friend Dennis Heaton and we literally shot that one in a day it was a one camera setup and you know I did makeup on it we you know we pretty well just it, you know it was it was a it was a clever little script that he had written he's actually a writer on uh, a lot of television and he's done some features himself he actually wrote uh, the feature Fido did you see that it's uh-huh, the uh-huh. it's the yeah so that's that's his film um, as a writer so when we finished Headshot, um, you know, literally we weren't expecting anything. We premiered at in competition in the short film category of the Berlin Film Festival as the Canadian representative. And we just, it was just hilarious because no one was expecting the Canadian entry would be completely non-heartfelt, non-important in that sort of way. It was a comedy snuff film. So, you know, oh, wow. it's a... Uh, it's one of those, um, you know, I, I, I think I've produced maybe five short films altogether, and that's the one that basically was like a, a lottery ticket, because literally we shot it in a day until we ran out of film, you know, we shot it super, I think it was on 16, and, um, you know, we, we just, it wasn't that we ex- didn't expect anything huge, we just didn't expect that, and I think it ended up going to 40-some festivals and winning so many awards, it was, uh, it, again, that, that was like a lightning bolt. So it was a it was a nice it was a nice experience on that one we we got to travel and and you know it was it was just fun because it was my first time being at the Berlin Film Festival and that was uh, kind of the biggest one so and then um, the, uh, you know again a few years later with Stained we actually ended up uh, premiering at the the Cannes Film Market under the Canadian banner and that was my first time at Cannes so it was kind of the oh my god you know <laughs> <laughs> well now, is that available anywhere in line to see or no. Uh, I don't think uh, Dennis has actually posted it anywhere, so I, I, I should ask him because I think to myself, we, you know, we really should. It's been a couple of years, and you know, I, I think it was on. Uh, we 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 sold to a couple of um, broadcasters and, and that sort of thing, so I don't know what our rights are on that right now. So, okay. Well, the, the next one was in 2005. It's a drama. Eighteen. Yes. 
Yes, that was uh, that one I was a co-producer on, and that one is uh, actually drama. You're right; it's a coming of age, and uh, it's uh, Richard Bell was the director, and I, you know, we had a whole bunch of stars on it. I remember, you know, well in that case, I was literally doing their business affairs, and um, my my co-producer at that point as well was uh, Koa Podolsky, and she was she was on set with them. If you notice now, my days on set until I actually started directing were kind of as minimal as I could. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have a nasty habit of tripping over cords and wearing inappropriate shoes. So, you know, it's uh, I, I used to avoid it, but um, it's, no. it's a reality of directing now that I actually have to be there. So. Oh, exactly. See, you know, I guess in your mind, my day will come. I'll just take <laughs> it slow, and then I'll be there. Just no, make you sure know, I wear the right shoes. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of times where you're sitting in a muddy ditch and thinking, really, did I give up pr- producing for this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to do much when I was producing. Yeah. I, I could go hide. <laughs> <laughs> there's been a, there's been a couple of actually that's the sad thing is that a lot of the the writing that I do when you're sitting you know with your screenwriter program, you think nothing of typing the words exterior, forest, night, right? Right. Because you're you're warm, you're comfortable, you're dry. Uh, fast forward to whenever and you're actually shooting it and you're like, God, why didn't I put interior, art gallery, day? You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one more here that I'm going to give you so I can let you go. Um, <laughs> the Beast of Dooley Greet. Is that how you say yes. that? Uh, Del Greet, yes. Okay. It's, uh, oh, it, it ended up being, um, I'd say it's like a Monty Python esque uh, comedy, but during set during like a period piece and it was a musical. So, you know, I. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, I, I, I've done a, a certain amount on, on that, and uh, I have to say that musicals are really, really, really challenging, just because, you know, you're singing, by the end, the entire crew can sing the song, and the actor will not be able to. I don't know why, but that, that will be it. You'll, you'll, you'll play the, that song until you're literally singing it in your sleep, but the only person who's supposed to be able to sing it, the actor, will inevitably not remember the lyrics. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's I... I think twice about doing musicals now. I, I do love them. I actually have a, a total weakness for really campy musicals, but to actually make one, it's wow, it's just hard. Well, you need to, you need to see Zombie Love. Okay. <clears throat> That's a musical that was sent to me last year. It's a short film, but what it is is about a zombie who's in love with a the non dead. Zomb- you know, the non-dead. It's a girl. So it's a whole musical. But I want to tell you something. Like I said to Dave Rita, I hated musicals. I did not like Little Shop of Horrors. I watched it, but I'm not a fan of it. Okay? But, <laughs> you don't have a suddenly Seymour moment? I'm sorry. I, I just, but the uh, zombie, lo- I absolutely love that. How they made that. I mean, I think it was from England. I know okay. it's a foreign country. But okay. my God. God was that good. It was just so. I'm in love with a zombie. No, it goes like this. Um, I'm in love with a non-dead person, and it goes on. I mean, I can't do op- that kind of stuff, but it was so cool. And I, everybody, you can laugh at me all you want, but when you watch Zombie Love, you're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about. When you watch this, the music gets you into it. It's just a fun <laughs> film. Is it available online? Is it? I don't think so yet, but I'll give you the information. Okay. I'll send you an email on Facebook, but uh, I have it here, as a matter of fact. And and every now and then I'll, I'll dig it, I'll dig it out, and uh, let my wife. My wife watches it, and she loves it. It's just something that I guess it's more like a icebreaker. You know, I'm into watching horror films all the time, and this is like, oh yes, having a bad day, just pop this in, and your face just light up, and you'd be happy. <laughs> you know, I use a tension breaker, but <laughs> yeah, you know, it's for probably for people who say they don't like horror, and then you know, you're 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 the exception to that. So yeah, uh, you know, I, I mean, I guess the older I get, the more I don't know, more open I am. So I, probably if I watch a lot Little Shop of Horrors now, I'll probably like it. But uh, when I was younger, you know, I was born in '68, so that came out like what in '84, '85. I think it was. I might have been like a teenager. You know, you know, teenagers back then, we ain't watching that damn music shit. Screw that. It's got to be horror. You know, you know how it is. 
was. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think that the problem was that I was I was such a dork in high school that I really was doing all the musicals. Like I was always behind the the scenes, like in in wardrobe or whatever. And so, of course, we know all of the musicals. And so, I grew up with um, quite a lot of, you know, unfortunately, very campy musicals are my background. So there's a there's a part of me that will probably always love really, really, really bad sort of. Um, yeah, I can I can still sing pretty well all of Fiddler on the Roof, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. I'm glad uh, I don't no, know I, that. I, you shouldn't be admitting this out there. It's like, you know, my the what is it? Any any stock I might have had is now rapidly plummeting. So <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> you're just showing that you're versatile. Okay. Well, you know, it's uh, I, I guess you just have to let your freak flag, flag fly. I can't even say that right. This variation of me, but yeah, it's it's. <laughs> well, you know, I'm very surprised. I have not got no comments. Now that's the second time that I mentioned Zombie Love, as far as the musical part of it, and I've not got no comments. So apparently, people think, "Yep, if Gruesome likes it, then I'm going to like it too." So I'm not going to make fun of them. Actually, I think that's the first podcast I ever heard of yours. Was you talking to I think Denise and Sh- and uh, Char and yep. uh, and you were Martin. actually also mentioning how you really like bloody uh, bride dresses. Is that you? That was. Well, we're talking about that. Uh, that was Tina <laughs> Molina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You remember? Ah, yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was our episode number two. Yeah. We we I guess we did two episodes, but. Uh, you know. It was because this is the first time I heard uh, Zombie Love, and I remember uh, I, w- I I think I had you on when I was sewing something, and I was thinking to myself, I have to write that down. That sounds really interesting because you know uh, the it, it's yeah. I have to say anything that has to do with musicals and horror. You know, I'm I'm not quite sure whether it's worked that successfully, but I do love Little Shop of Horrors, and I do drive around listen and and singing suddenly Seymour. So well, there's like <laughs> a group of three zombies and the one is in love with the non-dead and the other two don't like that idea so it goes through the whole short story and it's just a neat it, it was, it's just something different that I actually saw that you know it just it sticks with me because I really didn't think I'd like it but I really did. It just, Love will change everything. It'll, it'll. You know, maybe you're just a weirdo. That's just my thinking. Like maybe. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you said that because I'm sure you heard it in my interviews. I've always said it. I'm a weirdo. You know, <laughs> I'm a weirdo. Just, hey, whatever. You know, I'm an '80s horror fan, and I guess I'm a weirdo. You know, yeah. I just. You know, it's funny. You know, today you know, people say that this movie sucks and that movie sucks, but you know what? Every '80s movie that I have my collection or I've seen, none of them suck because I grew mm-hmm. up with them. I grew up right. I mean, a movie that is cheesy as hell, shitty as shitty could be, but I still love it because it brings back the memories of a ch- of teenage years growing up, and that's just the way it is. Certain things just stick with you, you know? Right. Do you think that will happen with the, the kids today when they're seeing, you know, maybe the remake of whatever it is, and that's their version of what the film actually is? Probably like, you know, more than likely because, like, my kids here, well, my kids are ages from 15 until 23, you know, um, now, I've groomed my kids to, they love 80s horror. Mm-hmm. Well, my one son that doesn't, doesn't like horror, period. Now, can you believe that? Gruesome Herzog's son does not like horror. <laughs> wow, what a slap in the face that is. But no, he's more into that, that, that drama action stuff. But yeah, but all the rest of them, they know... Uh, Lost Boys, they know, you know, older stuff like Motel Hell in 1980. I mean, I was 11 when that came out, you know, so I, you know, I, my kids have a good background in filming, so, you know, they're not just stuck on one genre, so that's good. Mm-hmm. But, uh, comedy, romantic comedies, and I love comedy horrors too, you know, yep. and I like John Candy comedy, that I liked, you know, from the <laughs> 80s. Again, that's 80s, see? 80s again. Yeah. But as far as a comedy today, I think one of the funniest movies I've seen is Tucker vs. Dale. Now, that I loved. Okay. Have That's, you seen that I, yet? I haven't seen it, so I... I oh, I, my God. you got to you got to get that one, too. That was... <laughs> that is... Oh, my God. That's a good film. You know, in most films like out there, you always... The kids go out in the woods, and there's always a killer out in the woods, which, by the way, I, I'm, I love woods horror. I've been saying that forever. But this movie is quite the tease them and yeah. uh, 
It's well, it's like a trailer. You don't want to basically give away the whole movie like they're doing nowadays, right? Well, I don't watch. That's one reason why I don't watch trailers. Right. See, I have a thing. I say this all the time. I will not watch a trailer because chances are there's going to be something that you're going to see in there, right? That mm-hmm. when you go to watch the movie, when that scene comes up, you already know what's going to happen, and that pisses me off. I want to go into a film where I know nothing about it. Right. You know, I don't read nothing. I go in blind. That way, my mind's open to what I'm going to see. And That's great. I'm a no, weirdo. I, I'm a weirdo. It's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of boring, especially since, um, and there's nothing worse, too, where you see a trailer, you it's given away the, the entire film, and then you go there, and it just feels like such a waste of time. Like I, I, I do still try to see as much as I can in the theater just because um, I love that collective experience of going off and seeing a film, you know, in a big group. So well, and, uh, They also... The, they also pull these stunts where they'll throw it in the trailer, and it's not even in the movie. They <laughs> suck you into going to watch it, you know? That work, that happens, too. Yeah, I I think that the the one that really got it for me is Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. Remember the one with Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that in and, theaters. And that the scene where I think one of them pushes the other one off the... The, the, the pier yeah, was yeah, yeah, hilarious yeah. in the trailer and it wasn't in the film I was so mad yeah, you remember yeah, that's how they <laughs> suck in that's how they used to suck you in to go into the theaters and see them but you know but anyways I don't watch trailers from my point <laughs> and, end of end of uh, conversation I just don't watch trailers I just don't right. want, I don't want to be anything to be spoiled and I a lot of people will watch a trailer before they watch the film why mm-hmm. would you do that well, you know, there's an art to that, too, like the, the trailer making and having uh, basically, you know, cut a few with my editor and, and uh, with other editors. You know, it is important to actually, because sometimes... Oh, well, yeah, know, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, and it's an art form unto itself. How do you actually, how do you make this thing into something? You know, because your, your film, hopefully, has a lot of twists and turns all the way through it. How do you get that across in the trailer without making, uh, without giving it away? And, you know, how do you do that teaser that you were talking about, right. you know? Just well, now, now, here's a weirdo move. <laughs> I'll watch the trailer after I watch the movie. Now, is that retarded or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I already saw it, so I can't ruin it. I'm a weirdo. I always, I always try to see if, if there's something in the trailer that's in there that that's not in the movie. That's why I watch it for, to see if anything was added that wasn't in the movie. So. Mm, mm-hmm. Oh, well. well, it's a uh, that's a that's a good and also how how many times do you watch a film before you you give the review? Is do you, do you watch it a few times or do you just watch it the once or how do you? I how? watch it once. Okay. And then good. I'll then I'll go back like next week if I have time and I'll rewatch it again. Mm-hmm. So you know, a lot of people will watch it. They'll, they'll say, "Oh man, I watched this two or three times before I did the review." See now now what happens there is now if you watch it more than once or twice. Then it starts um, playing tricks in your mind. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It might yeah. it might tend to give you um, a higher grade because you watched it twice. Now it's completely in your head. If that sounds stupid, but uh, I just like to I watch it once. I do my review. Um, every review I do, it's top of my head. Nothing's written down. I just go up to flow. You know, and mm-hmm. then on the fly, as they call it. And uh, but then I'll go back and watch. Now I'll watch it again and again and again if I have friends come over, and then I'll watch it again. You know, because then because a lot of films that if you watch it more than once, you do see things that you don't see the first time. And I think that's one of the reasons why people watch it a second time in case they miss something the first time to throw in their review. But mm-hmm. I'm a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's, it's, well, it's an amazing skill set to just be able to do it off the top of your head like that. Some, you know, I. Well, thanks, yeah. but I try to do everything. You know, sometimes, like I'll watch a movie like eight o'clock at night, and I'll watch it, and I'll go to bed, and I'll get up in the morning before I go to work, and I'll just pop the the, the recorder, and I just do my review. And now, there's another mindset that, that that works for me. If I watch a film, and if I go to bed. And usually, something that I've seen in a film that I really like will stick into my head the next morning. That's where I know, you know, that's how I know a film, you know I mean, if it's good. Because if something mm-hmm. sticks out in my head, that's another form of reviewing that I do. So Right. Good. 
It, it means that it actually hits you on some subconscious level. Exactly. Which is, if yeah. something stays in your mind, then you know <laughs> that movie's good. And that's how I know when a movie's really good, when you watch it and it sticks in your head for a couple of days. Yeah. So. Yeah. Babble it again. <laughs> no, no, it's good. But uh, anyways, Karen, I want to thank you for coming on. I really appreciate thank you so the conversation. so much for having me. No yeah. problem. And hopefully the interview was painless. Absolutely, it was actually a lot of fun. You, uh, you're a very intelligent and viewer, I, I have to say. So it, it, it's always nice to have a good conversation, and uh, it's nice to actually be able to talk about other films too. Just because you know we're we're in this because we actually love films, as compared to it's all about me. <laughs> right, right. And there's a lot of people that, sadly enough, in this world, it's thinking to myself, boy, you're boring. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, yeah. that's me too. So my, my wife tells me that all the time. She goes, shut up, honey. I don't want to hear about this damn movie. <laughs> it's all you talk about. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> but I must admit, though, she is, she's not a horror fan, but I got her hook on, on that chiller channel on the on the satellite. She loves cool. that channel now. So she watches all these elementary and all these horror movies, and she loves it. So, hey. Hey, I'm a weirdo. There you are converting everyone around you. <laughs> even even my coworkers are psyched. Oh brother. <laughs> but anyways, thanks again for coming on, Karen. Um, Thank you so much for having me, and uh, hopefully we'll do this again sometime. Oh, we certainly will. You know, the cabinet's <laughs> coming. You know, who knows? It is, and I've got. Uh, I'm and sorry, I had to. You know, I I got two more short films. I got a. I have my first music video, and and my first uh, uh, a first look into. I'm. I'm turning my head towards dark fantasy so we'll see how it goes interesting <laughs> yeah all so, right thank you well thank you okay. very much take care you too thanks bye, bye. bye. gruesome herzog the voice of horror